Good morning, everyone. I think um, we're going to get started. I'm a little discombobulated this morning, but I, I think I have put myself together relatively well. So um, I just want to say one more week until the winter solstice, and so that's a great time of celebration of winter time. And that is my little meteorological statement that I always like to start with. So today I am very honored to have Dr. Elizabeth Chapman presenting Grand Rounds today. Her title is, How Do You Know What They Know? The Challenges Doctors Have Communicating with Patients and How We Can Do Better. Dr. Chapman uh, went to medical school here at University of Wisconsin. She did her residency here as well, followed by chief residency. She's been a star um, from the moment she started training with us, and then went on to do her fellowship in geriatrics here at the University of Wisconsin as well. What's quite unusual is that immediately upon uh, finishing her residency program, she got two uh, medical directorships of very prominent programs in geriatrics. She became the medical director of the ACE program, which is acute uh, care elder service at University of uh, Wisconsin Hospitals and Clinics. And for those of you who have patients, including me as a primary care physician, that program uh, is a very huge value added program for our patients who are hospitalized and who are our elders. And when I asked Dr. Chapman what she was really most proud of in her CV, which is quite remarkable for someone very uh, early in their career, she said it was really uh, building that ACE program. And uh, as a shout out to that, I just found out this morning that in the top nurses of Madison, that one of the advanced practice providers who uh, is in the ACE and Transition program, who is the, the hearing aid fairy, whose name is, and I don't know you, I'm sorry, but I'm going to meet you after, Peggy Troller uh, received one of the uh, top nurses awards, and she's part of that team. <laughs> And the reason I mention this is because the other thing that Dr. Chapman said is that she's really part of a team, and the geriatrics group really represents that, and that's really emboldened in her, and she really wanted, uh, she brought that out this morning, so I wanted to mention that. She also is the medical director for the Geriatric Transitional Care Service at University of Wisconsin Hospital, and most recently, she has become the associate program director for the Geriatric uh, Medicine Fellowship, which is a very uh, renowned national fellowship. She's received many honors and awards. I'm going to do the two most recent ones. In 2016, she was bestowed the Leonard Toe Humanism Award in Medicine from the University of Wisconsin uh, School of Medicine and Public Health Gold Humanism Society. And uh, uh, like her nurse practitioner, uh, just a few months ago, she was named a top doc in Madison through Madison Magazine, which as many of you know is an award that is bestowed upon by your peers. She has had five published articles, of which two she has been first author, and over 11 invited uh, national research presentations. And we are uh, very honored to have Dr. Chapman speak to us today. Thank you so much, Dr. Trowbridge. I wish you could say that like every day when I'm starting out and feeling a little grumpy. Um, really, <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> so I wanted to start today actually with a little bit of a story, um, a story about my mom. And so um, my mom and I talk on the phone a lot. And one day I was talking with her about um, one of her friends who was really struggling with atrial fibrillation. So. They had tried rate control and it just wasn't working and they had tried rhythm control drugs and it really hadn't controlled her rhythm. She was still having a lot of issues with symptomatic AFib um, and she was actually in her mid-50s but contemplating an AV nodal ablation and being pacer dependent for the rest of her life. And it turned out that her brother had similar issues with AFib. And so my mom said something like, gosh, I'm really worried about her kids and his kids because this must be genetic. And being like the doctor daughter, I was like, well, you know, potentially it's genetic, but it's probably not like a single gene trait. And besides, you get two copies of every gene, one from your mom and one from your dad. And then there was sort of this gasp, like, <gasps> and silence on the other end of the phone. And I thought, what did I do? Is she OK? <laughs> What's going on? And what it turned out was that I had, had literally just blown her mind. My mom had never actually heard the idea that you get two copies of every gene, one from your mom and one from your dad. It's just something she had never come across in her lifetime. And when I thought about it, 
that actually made a lot of sense. Um, she graduated high school in 1975. She didn't go to college because she didn't want to be a nurse or a teacher, and she thought as a woman that was the only reason you would go to college. Um, and she knew she was going to work in an office when she graduated, so she took classes like typing, um, bookkeeping. So science wasn't something that she had studied. And this was just not something that she had ever heard of. And the more I thought about it, the more I thought, like, I don't actually remember when I didn't know about, like, Gregor Mendel and his pea plants. Like, I don't know when I learned that. Um, but it's definitely something that I just sort of assumed was common knowledge. And so as I was talking to my mom that day, I realized I have some blind spots as a doctor. There are things that I think people just know that they don't. Um, and, you know, I've come across issues with health literacy as a geriatrician in the hospital because I'm often assessing decision-making capacity. So I'm often asking people to explain their understanding of their medical situation. And there are often um, gaps there that I'm filling in. But it wasn't really until I talked with my mom that day that realized my own kind of issues <laughs> with maybe recognizing health literacy or recognizing where I'm not speaking the same language as someone else. And so with that, um, today I'm going to be talking about how do you know what they know, the challenges we have as doctors communicating with our patients, and how we can do better. I don't have any pertinent disclosures. And so my goals for today are to have you at the end of this talk be able to recognize that doctors are not regular people. <laughs> Um, and I'll go into a little depth about that. I also want you to be able to describe how health literacy impacts important health outcomes. Because it turns out that it is a really important factor in the wellness of our patients. For people, in fact, that I see for elderly populations, low health literacy is actually associated with higher mortality rates. So it's serious. I also want you to be able to review some data showing how physicians often fail to communicate um, clearly with their patients. Um, and I think that that's something easy to say, but I think we really need to recognize how often that happens, no matter what specialty we're in. And finally, I want you to be able to identify some effective methods for improving patient and physician communication, because it really matters how we talk to our patients. If we want them to do well, we have to explain things in a way they can understand. Um, that's why those HCAP surveys are always asking that question, right? There's a reason. So to accomplish those things, um, I'll start by talking about what makes doctors so weird. And it's just a snippet. There's, there's probably a lot more um, that I could talk about. And then I'll talk about health literacy. What is it, and how does it impact people's health? I'll move on to some data about how well doctors communicate. And then how can we do better? So let's get started. Why are we so weird? Um, I think the first and most obvious thing is that we're super nerds. And I say that with no disrespect. Um, you know, I consider myself a nerd. I married a nerd. We're raising a lovely, nerdy daughter. Um, but the truth is that we have been in school forever. Um, so this is data from the NCES, the National Center for Education Statistics. And every year they look at people between 25 and 29, and they look at their educational attainment, how far they've gotten in school. And you can see um, with this lower bar here that we do pretty well in this country getting people through high school. So over 90% of the population completes high school. And then associate's degree or higher, it's about 50% of the population. When you move up to um, a bachelor's degree or higher, it's closer to a third. And then when you get to us, so we're here at this top, right? Um, master's degree or higher, it's less than 10% of the population. And so if we actually took out the master's degrees in there, it's an even smaller number. And it's not just kind of the nerdiness of being in school forever. Um, it's also that going to school this long really gives us access to information that other people don't have access to, concepts that people may just have never come across. And I think that kind of speaks to my mom's situation in that you know, she just didn't go to college. She didn't take those science classes that I took over and over again. And so it's just, there's a piece of, of data they're missing. And I think back to college, there was always that thing about, okay, if you're gonna cite a work, you don't have to cite it if it's common knowledge. So if it's been published in three different places, you can say, oh, that's common knowledge. Um, but that's not actually common knowledge when we think about regular people. And so I think that that piece really um, is important to remember. 
The other thing about education is that when we're in this small group, we have to recognize that we're part of a really unique and privileged group of people. Um, and that difference is actually more stark when you look at the people that I take care of. Um, this NCES data goes back many, many years. And if you look back in 1950, only 52.8% of the population had a high school education in that 25 to 29 age group in those days. Um, so as we're moving forward and as I'm a geriatrician, you know, I'm taking care of people who had far less access to education than even the current people out there who may only have a high school degree. The other thing that I think sets us apart is that we are really and truly rich. Um, and I'm a geriatrician um, saying that, right? Like I'm not the most highly reimbursed specialist out there. Um, but this is data from the Census Bureau looking at annual person income in the United States. And you could argue, like granted, as medical students, we sort of started from the bottom, right? Um, we had that negative income for like four years. But once you get your faculty job, you know, now we're here at this top spot. Um, and we know that socioeconomic status is inextricably linked with health outcomes. Um, we can afford, as doctors, to live in healthy neighborhoods with green space, with clean air. Um, we can afford to buy healthy food. We can afford our medications or our medical equipment when we need them. It's not a burden to us to take a day off if we're sick. We can afford that. And not all of our patients can, and not all of our patients will have the means to do that. And it can be hard for us sometimes to really recognize what expensive means to someone when we live as comfortably as we do. The other thing I think that makes us different as doctors is that medical school is really joining a new culture. Um, you know, when you think about what makes a culture, it's a language, it's shared experiences, and it's also kind of behaviors or customs um, that are common in a group. And I think we have that in medical school. So first of all, there's the language piece, right? They say you learn like 13,000 new words in medical school. Um, and we use those words for a reason, because they're the most precise and kind of effective, efficient way of communicating with our colleagues. But that's also 13,000 words that most of our patients have probably not heard of. We also have some really weird things we've all done together. Um, so I think back to the first year of medical school when I spent months cutting apart a person, you know, and that was just like normal. We all did it together for days on end. Um, and when you think about it, who has done that besides like other doctors, um, people here and there who maybe were really into anatomy in college, or like morticians, maybe some serial killers? This isn't like normal stuff, you know? I've like taken out someone's lungs and held on to them. And I've, I've touched like smokers' lungs and non-smokers' lungs, and I could feel the difference. And that's an experience that our patients probably won't have, and if they do, you might wonder um, how they pass their free time. The other thing we do in terms of practices is that we're often asking people super personal questions, and it's normal for us. So, you know, I am always asking my patients when they last pooped. <laughs> like, that's just something that comes up. Um, we ask people about their intimate relationships, their um, stressors at home, all kinds of things that aren't necessarily dinner table talk. And, I think that it becomes normal, all of these things become normal, because we're surrounded by a bunch of other people who have done these things. But when I think back to that conversation with my mom, I realize that that isn't normal stuff, and it has skewed my sense of what kind of common experiences are. And I think as doctors, we need to keep that in mind when we're communicating with our patients, because it's often the case that something we think is very basic or very obvious might not be. So that's enough of that. Again, I could probably go on. Um, when we, we finish up, you guys can raise your hands about other things that make us on. Um, I wanted to move next to health literacy, what it is and how it impacts health, because communication with patients is a two-way street, right? We are providing information, but they also have to have the skills and the abilities to accept that information. So let's look at that a little bit more. I think we have to start with the definition, and you guys have probably heard this before. But health literacy is the degree to which an individual has the capacity to obtain, communicate, process, and understand basic health information and services to make appropriate health decisions. So to do the best that a person can for their health, 
they really need to be able to grasp what they're dealing with. And that takes a lot of different skills. And health literacy has been a hot topic for a while. Back in 2004, the Institute of Medicine um, put out health literacy, a prescription to end confusion. And I think that the executive summary by David Kindig, who was kind of the um, lead author on the report, um, gives us some really important pearls. So first he said, um, it will become widely appreciated that 90 million adults with limited health literacy cannot fully benefit from much that the healthcare system has to offer. 90 million adults, that's a huge number. Just to put that in perspective, um, there were about 300 million people living in the United States at that time. So essentially one out of three people had low health literacy. He also said it will become widely understood that health literacy is more than reading, but includes writing, numeracy, listening, speaking, and conceptual knowledge. And I think that this is really highlighted by my mom's situation. She's actually a voracious reader. Um, she's always getting through a new book. Um, she would do fine with that literacy piece. Um, and most health literacy tests really focus on that reading ability, which is a huge part of things. Um, but there's also this issue of writing, numeracy, so being able to understand facts and figures that we might hand out to patients, the listening and speaking abilities, and then the conceptual knowledge. You know, my mom was lacking that conceptual knowledge through no fault of her own, and, and really um, probably not something I should have expected her to know when I thought about it. I think this infographic is nice because it pulls together a lot of important information kind of in the number form about health literacy. So I'll walk you through it. First, 24 million um, Americans are not proficient in English. And to a certain extent in the healthcare system, we can deal with that using interpreters. You know, we have people who can help translate what we're saying for our patients into the language that they understand. Um, but as I said earlier, one in three American adults are basic or below basic um, when it comes to health literacy. We don't have interpreters for that. And so it's really supposed to be our job as doctors to be explaining things in a way that any patient can understand. And when you think about that one in three number, if you see three patients today, one of those patients probably has low health literacy and we're probably not connecting as well with them as we could be. Another really important statistic, I think, is that the average American reading level is seventh grade. <laughs> so here we are, we went through what, like 20 something -th grade, right? Seventh grade is the average reading level. And most of our health information that we give to patients, those handouts we give, are supposed to be written in eighth grade English. So even that's overshooting things a little bit. But when they've done studies on those handouts, um, often it's actually more than eighth grade, it's 10th to 11th grade English. And so even the things that we hand out thinking like, this is you know, gonna explain things because maybe the patient is struggling a little here, they might be falling short. And actually nine out of 10 adults have a difficult time using health information um, that's available in healthcare facilities, um, stores, and in the media. So that's the vast majority. And then there's this pie chart. So this is um, some of the same data that the Institute of Medicine report looked at. And they looked at the different levels of health literacy with proficient, um, intermediate, basic, and below basic all being represented. And I just want to show you here that this 12%, that's the people who are proficient. So about one in 10 people are actually really able to function well in the healthcare system and understand what they're supposed to understand um, without extra help. That's a pretty staggering number. That means 88% of the people we're interacting with don't quite have all the health knowledge they need um, to be able to really do the best that they can for themselves. And I think those numbers are meaningful, but I also think patients' own words can be really helpful to understand this. And so this is a quotation from a British study um, looking at health literacy. So they took a bunch of people who had screened for, um, they'd screened for health literacy, and they picked out the people who had low health literacy and asked them about their experiences in the healthcare system. And so this is a woman named Louise, and she says, I'm like that, oh no, they're wanting me to write something. Start panicking, and that seems to take over you. And sometimes they're like that, what was they saying there? Because the anxieties took over what's going on. So that quotation I thought was powerful because there's this sense of anxiety and worry just being in the medical system. 
it has nothing to do even with why she's there and why she's sick, which can also be anxiety provoking. But there's that fear of what she might have to do, the writing that might be really difficult for her, that's getting in the way of even listening to the healthcare provider. And if we're not recognizing that that's an issue, how often are we kind of missing the mark as doctors? And then there's this other quotation that I really liked from a review article um, about health literacy. So they had a public health nurse named, um, who was asked, interviewing someone named Jill. And Jill, um, she said, I see you're taking birth control pills. Tell me how you are taking them. And Jill says, well, sometimes I, some days I take three, some days I don't take any. On weekends, I usually take more. Um, my doctor said these pills were to keep me from getting pregnant when I have sex, so I take them any time I have sex. And so I thought that this was really a great quotation because the patient listened to her doctor. The doctor thought that he or she was describing something very clearly. You take one pill a day, et cetera. It's on the bottle. So she's really thinking she's doing her best, but chances are this is like a completely ineffective therapy for her. And if we hadn't had this lovely nurse ask the question the way she asked it, how are you taking your pills, this would have not come up. Um, and I think this really speaks to why most patient education is led by nurses. <laughs> um, but I think that there's a good chance if you ask Jill, are you taking your medications as prescribed, she would say yes. But clearly when you drill down, she's not. And how easy would this be for us to miss as doctors? Looking at those quotations, <laughs> Part of me thought, geez, maybe just talking to patients, we can pick up on their health literacy level pretty well. And there's actually a study that looks at this. So this is um, out of a VA in Houston. And what they did is they had patients um, screen for their level of health literacy. They went to their usual clinic visit. And then after the clinic visit, they had the physicians estimate on the same scale that they used to measure the health literacy, um, what they thought the patient's health literacy was. And here's what they found across all comers. Over, about 25% of the time, doctors overestimated the patient's health literacy. So I think you know, there might be some risk in like underestimating. You might offend someone by being a little bit too basic, but I don't think that's usually an issue. Overestimating is a problem, though. You're expecting a patient to understand something, and they're just not. Um, and you, know, you could say 75% of the time, we're pretty right on, and that's, that's good. But that still means that one out of the four patients that you see today, you're probably overestimating what they understand about what you just said. So if we're not good at picking up health literacy levels just by talking to our patients, how can we measure it? Um, I think one of the nicest ways to do this, um, to answer a question like this, is to look at the Rational Clinical Exam Series in JAMA, because they always do a really good job of doing a systematic review that's also practical for people who are busy and don't have a lot of time in the clinic. And so in this study, they looked at all different methods um, for measuring health literacy. They point out that the standard methods, um, which are mostly for researchers, take a really long time. So there's something called the TOFLA, and that takes like 35 minutes to administer. Most of us don't have 35 minutes with our patient on any given day to just do a health literacy screener, let alone like address their medical issues. Um, so obviously that's not useful. But what I liked about this paper in particular is that they found that there's four simple questions you can ask. You can ask each one of those individually and get a pretty good idea of where your patient's at. And they're pretty simple things. How often do you need to have someone help you when you read instructions, pamphlets, or other written material from your doctor or pharmacy? So that idea of using kind of a surrogate reader, having someone else read the information and interpret it for you. There's how confident are you filling out medical forms by yourself? So a pretty basic question. Um, and that's also fairly predictive of whether or not someone has decent health literacy. How would you rate your ability to read? So reading is a big part of understanding the things we give to our patients. And if someone is not so confident, if they say it's okay or worse, chances are that their health literacy is relatively low. And finally, how often do you have problems learning about your medical condition because of difficulty understanding written information? And so the positive um, likelihood ratios for all of these questions are pretty high, somewhere between about three and five. So if we have the time to ask just this one question, we can get a good idea of where our patients are at. And that seems practical. That seems like something we can do. And all this talk about health literacy wouldn't really matter if it didn't impact health outcomes. So if regardless of where our patient was coming from as far as health literacy, 
if they did find any way, it wouldn't be a big deal. And there's been lots and lots of papers looking at this, and I could spend easily the whole hour talking about this subject alone. Um, but I thought the best way to summarize this data was this review article, which is relatively recent and really kind of sums up um, what outcomes have been pretty well um, proven in the literature. And so I'll blow this up here. But basically, um, low health literacy is consistently associated with things like more hospitalizations, greater use of emergency care, lower receipt of some important preventative um, procedures like mammography screening, influenza vaccination, poorer ability to demonstrate taking medications appropriately, poorer ability to interpret labels and health messages. So if you say to a patient, good news, your chest x-ray is negative, understanding what that means might be really difficult for a person. And here's, I think, the thing that hit home most with me. So among older persons, poorer overall health literacy is associated with worse health and higher mortality. So it does matter. And it probably matters a lot because it's hard to take care of yourself if you don't understand what the doctors are asking you to do. So thinking about health literacy, we know that in general, um, it's really common to have low health literacy. We also know that as doctors, we're really bad at picking out who has low health literacy and who doesn't, even though there's some easy ways to measure it. And unfortunately, because of that, people don't do as well as they should. But to this point, I've really talked about the patient's end of things. And it's a two-way street, right? So physicians are also part of the issue when it comes to communication. And so next, I wanted to focus on what data we have about how well doctors actually communicate. And I think the study that probably had the biggest impact relatively recently and was really like buzzy um, was from 2012 in the New England Journal when they took about 1,200 patients with stage four lung or colorectal cancer and most of them were receiving chemotherapy. And they had at least once discussed chemotherapy with a physician. And then they asked them the chances that their chemotherapy was curative. And what you'll see on this graph here is that if we add all these numbers up, nearly 70% of people with lung cancer and over 80% of people with colorectal cancer that was incurable failed to recognize that their chemotherapy was not curative. <laughs> and that's the majority of people, right? So the majority of people are getting this treatment, which can often be difficult to tolerate, which um, has a lot of side effects and they don't recognize that this isn't going to cure them. And you could say this is just one study, right? But it turns out that this has been replicated lots and lots of times. So a subsequent review um, that included 34 different studies from across the world um, found that this prognostic awareness for people with end-stage cancer was about 50%. So 50-50 chance if your patient who's dying of cancer knows they're dying of cancer or that the chemotherapy they're getting for prolonging their life but not curing their cancer is intended to do that. And interestingly, in these studies, they didn't always look at health literacy, but they did find pretty consistently that there was no association of this lack of prognostic awareness with level of education. And so if we can't blame the patient end of things, I think we have to look at ourselves as doctors about how we're communicating this. And it's still kind of boggled my mind for a long time um, until relatively recently, um, I was talking with my sister, so I have another family story. So that's my sister, Lauren. And she and I were talking about a relative who had passed away recently, and she was in her 90s, and she had advanced COPD, she was on home oxygen, she was pretty frail, she fell at home and ended up with a thoracic spine fracture and was in a lot of pain. And so she was in the hospital for a couple weeks, and eventually they realized that this was a pathologic fracture, and they did a biopsy and found that she had adenocarcinoma of unknown primary um, in her spine, and that was what led to the broken bone. And so my sister and I were talking about it on the phone, and she was saying, man, if they had found that cancer earlier, maybe she wouldn't have died. And, you know, being the doctor's sister, I was like, well, um, and went on to explain that, like, you know, she wouldn't have been a good candidate for chemotherapy. She was so frail already. And besides, you know, it was already metastatic cancer. And my sister's response was, I don't know what that word metastatic means. <laughs> and I was taken aback yet again, thinking, shoot. <laughs> I just sort of threw that word out there, not thinking, because 
if I said that in this audience, which is basically the people I'm surrounded by all day, um, here and at home, um, they would know what metastatic means. They would know that that means this is going to kill you. Um, but she didn't know that. And so then I thought back to these studies and how very possible it is that the doctor said something like this metastatic word and the patient heard it but didn't know what it means and therefore didn't understand the implication of it. So it's not just oncologists where this is an issue. Um, I think it's easy to look at the advanced cancer population because they have a very clear prognosis. So you know that someone with stage four cancer is going to die. And so it's very easy to then see how well a person can pick up on that. So there's a lot of times we're communicating with patients, maybe not something that's quite as serious, um, but that can have important implications. And so um, there's a paper that actually looks at the consenting process, which is something that as physicians we do fairly often. Um, even as a geriatrician, if I'm on gen med wards, we might be consenting someone for blood or whatever. So it's something that we do. And so in this study, they took 102 patients undergoing first-time elective cardiac catheterization. And they did these quizzes, pre- and post-consent process. And the quiz pertained to the risks, the benefits, and the alternatives of the procedure, kind of the crux of what consent is supposed to cover. And what they found is that before the quiz, um, people didn't do so great. So only about 10% had what they would consider like an adequate understanding of the risks, benefits, and alternatives, which is actually pretty good considering they hadn't been told much about them yet. But then after the consent process, which is supposed to cover all of those things really well so that when they're signing that form, um, they are saying, yes, I'm giving you my informed consent. And it turns out that only about 50% had what they considered good understanding. That's not great, right? That means that if you consent someone, at least in this study, one person out of every two was signing for a procedure that they didn't really completely understand. And it's not just cardiac caths. Um, subsequent systematic review looked at um, multiple different procedures, so not just internal medicine procedures, but also urologic procedures, orthopedic procedures, um, all the different studies that had been done looking at the consent process and how much the patients understood after it. And about 21 to 86 percent of the patients in those studies um, actually understood the key data presented. So we're falling short there. And I think, especially in a place like Wisconsin, where people are nice and they don't want to like make you feel bad by asking a question because you didn't explain something well, this could really easily fly under the radar. But it's also not just consents. So I work in a hospital. That's where I spend most of my time. And something pretty basic is explaining to a patient why the heck they're in the hospital. Um, and so I really liked this study because they asked people, tell me why you're here in the hospital. And they started with 46 hospitalized adults in a medical unit. And then they looked at the records of the patient. So what did the doctor say was the reason they were in the hospital? And they're comparing basically that patient perception, what the patient understands, with what the doctor is documenting. And you can see that 52% of the time they were concordant. So the doctor and the patient had the same idea. So good for those 52%. But that also means that 48% did not know. They didn't have the same idea. So there was 11% that just said, I don't know. Um, and then there was 37% where they said something different, something wrong. And when they drilled down into that 37%, um, actually 71% of the time, those people identified a completely different organ system. So maybe they came in because they were short of breath, so they're thinking the problem is their lungs, but it was actually that they were having a heart attack, right? Totally different organ system, but the patient doesn't know it. And that's pretty startling um, as a doctor because if we can't even communicate effectively why a patient is seeing us, how are we supposed to help them understand what they then need to do to get healthy? That's a huge challenge. And I think what it really comes down to is that we're just not always speaking the same language. And um, going back to that qualitative study um, from the British folks that I mentioned earlier, there's some great quotations in there that I thought I would bring up at this point. Um, because, again, the patient's own words sometimes are really helpful. So they noted that staff, especially doctors, um, sorry guys, um, often used words that were described as gobbledygook, big fancy words, and 24-letter words. 
Um, <laughs> we're rattling these things off, and I'm completely guilty of it myself, right? Um, but just don't make sense to people. The other thing that I thought was really telling in this study is this quotation. So this is Harry. He's in his 40s. And he says, this hospital consultant was blah, blah, blah. He knew fine. I didn't have the foggiest idea what he was talking about. I love British people. Um, that's, that's such a nice way of saying he didn't know what that means. Um, what I was supposed to be listening to. Um, but really, I think that that says a lot. The patients think we know we're totally like talking in our own world. They think we are well aware of how bad of a job we're doing. But are we? <laughs> I would argue no, and I think this study also um, is some good evidence that we're not necessarily aware of those shortcomings. So this looked at end-of-life discussions, and um, they took some internal medicine trainees, and before um, they interacted with a the patient, they had them rate their competence in end-of-life discussions. So on a scale of 1 to 10, how good are you at having these conversations and conveying the kind of key information? And then they had the patients rate the trainee that they talked to. And they use the same scale. Um, it's actually a validated scale in terms of quality of communication at end of life. And usually when you see a scatter plot like this, you see like a line drawn through it. Um, that's like a best fit, like there's a correlation somehow. And you can see that there is no line in this figure, right? So we have across the bottom here the trainee perceived competence, and you have the patient assessment of their competence. And they found no correlation. <laughs> Um, so there were people out there who thought they were doing a horrible job that were actually doing pretty okay. More concerning, there were people who thought they were doing a really great job, and they were not. But really, there was no way to predict how well the person was going to do based on their own self-reflection. And so I think patients think we know when we're doing a bad job, but it turns out we've got this blind spot. And I've already shared some examples of from my own life where that's certainly the case. And so when we're talking with patients, there are these blind spots. And I think sometimes when we recognize that we're not necessarily on the same wavelength as a patient, our first instinct is to hand out those health facts for you if you work in the UW system. And when I was thinking about that, I kind of thought about this figure about equality versus equity. We're kind of using this one-size-fits-all measure to help our patients understand things better because it's what we've got. But, you know, think about that. If something's written at an eighth grade reading level and we're giving it to our patients, sure the person with a 12th grade education is going to do okay. Um, maybe it gives them some extra information, maybe it doesn't, but they were doing fine anyways. If someone has an eighth grade reading level, it's probably just enough that maybe they're getting some important information that they didn't otherwise know. But if someone has a sixth grade reading level, we're not helping them. Um, we're not really doing anything to compensate for their lack of knowledge because they can't use that paper we just handed them. And so what I think the approach really needs to be is one that's more similar to equity, where we have some sort of personalized intervention that we can use for everyone. So maybe that person with a 12th grade education has a basic understanding, but we could boost it even further and help them advocate better for themselves. Maybe that person who has an 8th grade reading level could potentially not only understand something, but really be able to manage themselves better, and similarly with a, for a person with a 6th grade reading level. So how can we do that? That's my next goal. How do we do better? And before we get too deep into this, um, I thought we should spend a little bit of time thinking about adult learning theory, which is not my area of expertise. Um, but this is Malcolm Knowles, and there are some kind of key points um, when it comes to adult education that he sort of initially um, described. And I'm just stealing a few of them. So one of them is to assess the learner's specific needs. So when we are talking with our patients, we have to figure out what they know. The next one is to set a cooperative climate, and I think that's really using language and an approach that's comfortable for patients. And then evaluate a learning experience quality and adjusting. So after we've delivered this information, we can't just be like, we're done. Um, we have to stop and see if what we did was effective. And so I think translating that into kind of like doctor talk, <laughs> we need to assess understanding before teaching, use simple common language that makes our patients feel comfortable, and then use the teach back method um, to really check in and see how well we did. So when it comes to assessing understanding, there's a lot of data already out there that this is a good thing to do. Um, and it doesn't necessarily 
in the literature pertain to health literacy, but it does have a lot of published efficacy in the area of palliative care. And so you guys in the audience, how many of you have heard of spikes, right? So Dr. Campbell has done a really good job of this spikes from the mnemonic spreading it, right? Um, and it's setting, perception, invitation, information, knowledge, empathy, summarize, and strategize, right? But that second thing, after we've got the room looking the way it should and we're kind of prepared to sit down, is to assess the person's understanding of their situation. And there's also this pewter mnemonic. Anyone here ever heard of this one? Yeah, it's a little less commonly used. Um, it was actually developed initially for like school counselors, but they've also um, published some studies using this method um, in the palliative care um, fields. And it's very similar. So prepare, so get yourself together, get the environment ready. Evaluate, which is evaluate the person's understanding of their situation. Warning, telling, emotional response, and regrouping or preparation. And I think that the nice thing about both of these mnemonics is really driving home that point that we have to figure out where our patient is. You know, a teacher wouldn't start with long division in math class. They would make sure that you knew how to add, subtract, and multiply before you get to that long division piece, right? And so as doctors, when we're talking with people, we need to figure out what they already know before we deliver something that may be more complex than they've already heard. And so these strategies have been proven to be very effective um, in breaking bad news and having difficult conversations. But I think they can also be applied to not difficult conversations, just regular discussions about health. And to that end, I wanted to share another story um, about a patient I saw um, when I was asked to assess capacity. So he was an older gentleman. Um, he was transferred from an outside hospital with oliguric renal failure. And he had agreed to transfer to our hospital. He had actually agreed to lie in placement. He had agreed to start dialysis. But then um, they spun his urine, and he had some dysmorphic RBCs and some red blood cell casts. And so they really wanted to do a renal biopsy. Um, but when they said, can we do a renal biopsy, he was like, no. <laughs> and so immediately then, like, the alarm bells are going off, like, this guy doesn't know what he's doing. Um, and so <laughs> geriatrics was called to figure out if he had capacity to refuse that procedure. And so I started by asking him his understanding of his situation, because that's often how I start a capacity assessment. And he could actually tell me pretty well that his kidneys weren't working and that he was on artificial kidney treatments to replace kind of the work his kidneys couldn't do. So that was pretty good. Um, and then I asked him why he didn't want a biopsy. What was his understanding of that? And he said, I don't want anything experimental done to me. So he had heard of dialysis before. This is something that he knew about. But he hadn't heard of the word biopsy. And the more I talked with him, I found out that he actually left school at third grade um, because his father had died, and he was the oldest of several kids, and so he started working. Um, when we ended up doing the Realm short form rapid estimate of adult literacy in medicine um, short form, which is like seven questions, um, based on that test, he was actually functionally illiterate. So he couldn't read. And when this biopsy came up, he was basically just handed a piece of paper, like the health facts for you about biopsies, and said, we want to do a biopsy. Here it is. Um, read this. And he couldn't read this. And so to him, it sounded like something really scary, something that he wouldn't want to do. And so he said no. Um, but when I was able to sit down and figure that out and we talked about it, he said, well, of course I want a biopsy. <laughs> if you can figure out what's wrong with my kidneys and maybe there's a chance they'll get better, of course I would say yes. And so his perception was really important to assess because that was kind of the big barrier there. But I think his story also brings up another important point, and that is using plain language. We have to make our patients comfortable by speaking in a way that they can understand. And this is a paper that I really love because it's just like adorable. Um, <laughs> but this is from the BMJ just last year. Every year when they publish like their Christmas issue, they have kind of, I don't know if I should call them fluff pieces, but they're kind of funny things. Um, there was last year, in addition to this article, something about like the man cold and how it is actually um, a worse sickness than what women get. Um, <laughs> so this one is called Santa's Little Helpers, a novel approach to developing patient information leaflets. And so this is a physician from Great Britain. And what she did was she went to a third grade classroom because the reading level in Great Britain is third grade um, on average. And she told third graders what it means to get their hip replaced. So she went through the procedure and kind of all the details. And then she said, OK, kids, um, I want you to 
tell me what doctors should let their patients know. And it's lovely. So what they, they came up with, um, we'll just look at the complications of risks, <laughs> right? Mohammed's like, you can die. Um, <laughs> that's true, right? Um, Maria says the danger is you could wake up and it could harm your body and you could get a chest infection, you could feel so dizzy that you could fall off the bed later. That might happen, um, especially in my older adults, right? Um, hip infection and blood clot also. Jamie said the surgeons might accidentally make a mistake and cut the wrong thing. That is true. It's a never event, but it could happen. Um, Sarah set off a metal detector. I don't actually know about that one. Um, lung infection, water infection, too much anesthetic, a vessel might pop, wake up in the operation. Emily said the bone could be put in badly, the replacement bone could be dirty, and you could get blood poisoning. This is actually really good, right? And like, we all understood it. And I'm not advocating for like child labor in writing um, <laughs> patient information, but I do think that this is something that shows we maybe need someone who's not a doctor putting this stuff together and really can think about it in a way that normal people think about things. And to that end, I am related to a bunch of normal people um, who are not doctors. And as I was preparing for this, I started thinking about how I really don't know what normal words are anymore. Like, I pretty much nerd out every day with my husband around the dinner table because we're both doctors, and it's just part of our life. <laughs> um, so I did what anyone in this situation would do. I sent my family a Qualtrics survey. Um, <laughs> and this is what I asked them to do. So I said, in your own words, without looking anything up, please explain what a heart attack is. Um, and I asked a few other things. And so this is what they said. Your heart is beating erratically or stops. Kind of. A heart attack is when the heart is not beating properly and blood isn't flowing through the body, right? Sort of. Um, a blockage in the heart so your heart can't pump properly, so it goes haywire. Sort of. Blood flow to from the heart stops due to artery blockages or other issues and the heart is no longer effectively pumping blood through the body. Your arteries get clogged and can no longer pump blood, blood well, question mark. <laughs> Um, I also asked them what a stroke is, when blood stops flowing to the brain, cussing damage. Um, there's some dyslexia in my family. Um, a stroke is when blood flow to the brain is blocked. Usually when someone's having a stroke, their speech will be slurred and they won't be able to move half their body. That's pretty good. It's a burst blood vessel or blockage, usually in the brain. <laughs> not entirely sure, possibly when the brain does not receive blood to a certain area, perhaps because of a blood clot. Again, low confidence in that one, but like a good answer. Um, something with the brain, maybe lack of oxygen, but then you have an attack and it gets damaged if it's really bad. And then also pneumonia. And I like this first one, when your bronchial tubes are inflamed, like confident, wrong. <laughs> um, <laughs> pneumonia, when someone has an infection in their lungs. So that's good. Your lungs have an infection along with fluid. Fluid in the lungs causes respiratory issues, like maybe on a microscopic level, sure. Um, lungs have an infection, question mark. So the thing about this is I knew I was probably going to be proven to not have really understood what they knew. Um, but I tried to pick what I thought were layman's terms, you know, pneumonia, stroke, heart attack. These are words I use all the time in the hospital, and I think people know what they mean. And they kind of do but not quite. Um, so I think that when we're using plain language, we have to be super plain, and we really have to be sure that we're kind of defining things. So after I did this, now when I say heart attack, I actually explain a heart attack. Or if I say pneumonia, I say, that's an infection in your lungs. Um, because I realize that even those words I consider layman's terms aren't necessarily easy for people to understand, at least on a physiologic level. And so finally, I want to talk about the teach back method. And I just talked about how we should assess our learners' needs before we move forward. Who has heard of this before? Right? Like everyone. Um, and that's because this is what we're supposed to be doing. Um, so the AHRQ highly recommends using the Teach It Back method, and they actually point you to this website. And they have a really nice definition of what it is. It's a way to make sure you, the healthcare provider, explain information clearly. It's not a test or a quiz of patients. It's asking a patient or a family member to explain, in their own words, what they need to do in a caring way. It's a way to check for understanding and, if needed, re-explain and check again. And it's a research-based health literacy intervention that promotes adherence, quality, and patient safety. I think that's a great summary. Um, and it turns out that the Joint Commission thinks we should be doing this. Um, and in the executive summary of this, what did the doctor say, improving health literacy to protect patient safety report, um, they actually say that we should use this as kind of in universal precautions, just like we put on gloves every time we touch bodily fluids. Um, so use this approach 
in all patient encounters, including that plain language piece, but also just that probing for understanding. This is something we should do. And so it says it's evidence-based. Does it work? I think that this is a nice review article looking at it. So um, they took a bunch of different studies where TeachBack had been used to see kind of what outcomes they could agree result from it. And there was a lot of heterogeneity, so it's not a systematic review, it's just a narrative review. But what they found is that when it comes to chronic diseases, which is often where we use this, think like diabetes education, heart failure education, um, it improves adherence to diet and medication regimens in diabetes, retention of knowledge regarding heart failure and diabetes, self-care in diabetes and hypertension, and disease-specific self-efficacy in diabetes. So it helps our patients do the things they're supposed to do with their diet and their medications, retain the knowledge so actually understand what's going on, and take care of themselves and feel confident doing it. So those are some great kind of points that TeachBack um, can do for us, things that, that we can look for. There's a lot of other populations who don't have chronic diseases where this has also been studied, and I'm going to kind of just zoom through them to give you an idea of how robust the evidence is for this. Um, so this is a study of pediatric patients with asthma, and the upshot is that it increased affective engagement and patient-centered communication. So they recorded conversations between patients and families with a child who had asthma, and they found that really the communication quality was better by objective measures when TeachBack was used. Um, this is a paper looking at the emergency department population, so people were either randomized to teach back or not randomized, or randomized to usual care, rather. And they found that in people with low health literacy in the emergency department, it increased comprehension of medications, of self-care, follow-up, and return precautions. So they actually knew what to do much better after having that teach back than if they hadn't gotten it. Similarly, another um, ED study, it was a pre- and post-study, so they hadn't been doing teach back, and then they did start doing it. And they found that in all comers, so not just people with low health literacy, it increased recall of diagnosis, medications, follow-up, and return precautions. And then this was a study in kidney transplant recipients, again, using TeachBack versus not. And what they found is that it increased self-management scores, so people were better able to know what to do in these hypothetical situations if they had gotten TeachBack. And so on the doctor end, this seems to work. Like, we do a better job when we do this. But what do the patients think? And the data is a little bit mixed here. Um, that first study of asthma patients um, was also a qualitative study. And so what they did is they asked people after they had gotten teach back kind of what they thought about it. And the parents said that you do have to use the method correctly to avoid offending the patient. So you can't be kind of presenting it as a quiz because that will seem um, unpleasant for a patient. But if you do it the right way, it shows that you care. And they actually thought patients should be asking for this. They should say, let me tell you what I took away from that, because it works so well, it's so important that we should be asking our doctors to let us do this. This is another um, snippet from that emergency medicine study that was randomized. Interestingly, in this one, even though the patients had better understanding, they had no improvement in their satisfaction or their perception of better understanding. So they didn't necessarily feel that great after their teach back, but they didn't have a negative perception. It was just kind of neutral. So at worst, it didn't make them feel any different, but it didn't offend them. And then this was a neat study that used a telemedicine model. So it was a nurse triage line, and people were randomized to either teach back or not teach back. And what they found is that um, if a person had low health literacy, it increased their perception of being listened to. So that teach back model really made the person feel like the person on the other end of the phone, which is often a harder way to contact, connect with people, was hearing them. And so I think that you know the data is a little bit mixed here. At worst, it doesn't offend people. And at best, it makes people feel like they're getting better care. So just to summarize teach back a little bit here, it's recommended for all patients, regardless of health literacy. Thinking back to my mom, she would score fine on a health literacy screener, but there still might be some conceptual knowledge she's missing. And if you use teach back with her, you'd be able to pick up on that in a way you couldn't otherwise. It probably improves patients' understanding overall. It may improve patients' perceptions of care quality. So it's an effective way that helps us engage better with our patients. So just to summarize how we can do better, I think there's three key points here. First, check to see what your patient already knows about their health. Think of that spikes mnemonic. Use plain language, really, really plain language. Use teach back when sharing new information. So just make it a habit. Okay, 
So we're close to the end of the hour. I've got a little bit of time yet. I'm hoping that at this point you agree with me that doctors are not regular people, that health literacy impacts important outcomes, that doctors don't communicate as well as we think we do, but there's hope. Um, there's some universal communication strategies that we can use with everyone that can help. And one is checking that baseline knowledge. The other is using plain language. And finally, using teach back when providing new information. So thank you guys for listening. Um, <laughs> We're going to have a couple minutes for questions. First, I'll say Teach Back was on my boards recently. Yes. Um, and <laughs> I wanted to say I thought you put the, la the, the literature together brilliantly. Thank you. And this was inspiring and sobering. So with that, questions? Yes. Okay. I think Dr. Seifert was first. So <laughs> Please repeat the question. Yes. So the question is, kind of in that after visit summary, is that what we're supposed to call it? Um, you type in really big, bold letters kind of the key pieces in plain language, and then the patient often wants to take that to their family members, have a few copies, really appreciates that anecdotally. Is there data to support that? Um, and I didn't see anything in, in particular about kind of that written information, but when they have looked at studies of how patients do or don't understand things better. We know that using kind of a multimodal approach is really helpful. So it's not just the listening, it's having something that's written. And so that definitely has some support, the idea that if we give people information in multiple different ways, so if they're auditory learners, if they're um, visual learners, having those multiple different options can be helpful. And then having those surrogate readers also um, can be a big benefit. Uh, one question and then we're gonna be done. Um, I guess right in the middle. <laughs> Great question. So if, are there any studies that pictures can help improve understanding and literacy? And um, again, kind of similar to what Dr. Seibert was saying, um, if you have different modes of presenting information, it can often be helpful. Um, and so pictures can be helpful. Also videos can be helpful um, in different studies that I came across. And um, a lot of it depends on how complex that picture is. So part of health literacy is like this graphicacy, um, which might be a made-up word, but it's out there. Um, so if you just give someone, say, like a pictogram or a graph or something, if they don't have the skills to interpret it, it might not be helpful. So it depends on the person and potentially how you walk them through it. But yes, pictures can be helpful. Um, I think when you go in through the hospital, you'll often see when someone has kind of like a complex thing that we're talking about doing a procedure for, there's like a sort of horribly drawn like liver or something on the board and there's arrows and whatever. We, we do use that and I'll have patients, um, if I'm assessing capacity of the picture on the board, they'll often point to that. Well, the doctor said this, you know, and so I do think it helps, um, but it kind of depends on the approach and if it's right for the, the particular patient. Thank you very much. Please come forward and give the questions.